I pull in the middle of the street, put my car in park, and I hop out of my car real quick, and he sees me, and I go, hey, you've got fire all down the side of your house here. Um, is everyone out of your home? I go, it's just a matter of moments before it's, it's into your house. My name is Chad Cook. I am an assistant chief with Ventura County Fire. I'm the uh, bureau manager for the Bureau of Support Services with the county. I've been with them this year will be 28 years. Prior to my employment with Ventura County Fire, I worked for the County of Los Angeles as a wildland firefighter before I came to Ventura County back in the uh, late 80s. I started doing that and when I got in as a, hired as a full-time firefighter with Ventura County, um, the education just continues and the work path continues. and you grow in the agency and you get more experience underneath the belt, you see a lot more stuff and as you move forward, you, you, there's different elements of wildfire. There's everything from mostly fuel types, uh, dealing with different fuel types and then over the years how fire progresses into the urban interface and where you're actually dealing with it, not just out in the hills and in the mountains and in the foothills of communities and now it's actually intermixed within communities now, so it's a, there's a different art to it. Thomas Fire was the perfect storm because you, you had more elements involved. For any firefighter that that studies wildland fire, there's some components that are needed for you to have the perfect storm. And probably the biggest element we had that night was wind. You know, Mother Nature flips on the fan. And in Southern California, we have the phenomenon of the east wind. And it is, you know, different areas, different geographical areas experience different types of fire behavior. So on the coast, uh, the front country of Santa Barbara, off the San Ynez Mountains, you have um, sundowner type events with, which they know and they expect that when the humidity lowers, the actual amount of moisture in the air, when the temperatures rise a little bit and when you get wind behind things, those factors have the ability to push fire around. So most firefighters pay attention to weather. It is a a big component in how we deal with things. It's a component in how we staff. It's a component of our, of our readiness. And the night of the Thomas fire was no different. We, we expected it. The prediction systems now and our partnerships with the National Weather Service and our cooperating agencies and other people and other entities is important. And we get good intelligence prior to weather events. And we act on that intelligence. And that night, we were acting upon the fact that, hey, the wind's going to come in. The humidity should be down in single digits. We've been in prolonged drought for a number of years. The fuel is ready to burn. There's an abundance of it. You put wind behind it like that happened that night and you have a start in a geographically challenging area that has not seen fire on the landscape in some time and you have a, a recipe for, for a disaster. Again, time of day plays a big factor too. I mean, fire burns better in the daytime, there's no question about it, but if you add wind to it, it'll burn good at any time. The wind was the driving force that night. Again, preparatory actions are key for our success, and we have different levels of preparatory action. We call them plans. We have uh, levels of plans from one, two, three. We had upstaffed into a plan two, which brought uh, extra resources on and equipment on that night. Those extra resources were strategically placed throughout the county to deal with the potential for fire. I happened to be on duty a little later that night as well. I was in my office in Camarillo. I had just was getting ready to leave the office a little after six o'clock in the evening when the alarm sounded for this fire. An upgraded brush fire, 10,000 Santa Paula, Ojai Road, near Thomas Aquinas College. And the location piqued my interest because of my background and how long I've been with the county. It piqued my interest because I know the fuel bed, I know the area. And instantly I'm going, oh, they probably got some pretty good down canyon wind. It comes down off the top of the Topa Topa Mountains. It comes off the front country of the Los Padres National Forest. I go, I bet there's some pretty good wind. But you usually wait, you don't overreact, and you want to hear what's going on. So you, you pay attention to it a little bit. There's very capable, and there, we have good firefighters in Ventura County where, once again, this type of an event is not new to them. As the thing started escalated, I um, was listening to it, and I responded from my office. And, I, within miles of getting there, you could see the fire from across the uh, Oxnard Plains. It was visible to all by, um, by anybody looking in that general direction. I knew we had a, a, a pretty good fire in our heads. I could listen to the radio traffic too and I could hear some of the, uh, the stuff happening before I arrived. And command post locations, immediate threats that were going on, um, 
the potential was being discussed right away and then what actions were being taken. We had an initial command post set up on Highway 150 at a park on Highway 150. It was just south of the fire location. Within minutes of arriving to the actual command post location, most of the area was soon to be affected by fire. People were evacuating the area. There was a lot of foot traffic, a lot of vehicle traffic on Highway 150. There was a lot of looky-loo traffic. It, this was lighting up the night sky too. And the wind was every bit of 40 to 50 mile an hour at the command post location right off of Highway 150. Venture, you copy five type one strike teams? Venture, copy an additional five type one. Uh, immediate need, Venture. Venture, copy immediate need. There was large resource orders being placed for fire equipment to come in, but immediately we were looking at maps going, okay, what is the impact zone within the next 30 minutes? What do we have on scene? What is within our threshold of control? What, with is, what is within our power to make a difference right now, life safety-wise? A lot of people think the fire department, you show up and you're just going to squirt water and you're going to put things out and you're going to be able to handle this. Well, most of the time we do. We're very successful with our initial attack operations in fire, but on a fire like this that's being pushed by the wind and has a very broad front to it, you don't have enough resources to be everywhere. And the amount of ember production and the amount of potential and where this fire is headed has to be realized early. And that was what my mindset was going there, was going, do we realize that we have a, a fire with a ton of potential here? And are we thinking appropriately? My mindset was not into water on the fire. My mindset was into, are we thinking of the magnitude of where this will be in 30 minutes, one hour, two hours, four hours, eight hours, 12 hours? Do we have a, are we thinking far enough out in front right now, like where will this thing be in 12 hours from now? And that was my, my mindset going into it. And then it takes a little bit once you get there to get a lay of the land, look at the footprint of the fire, and then apply your thinking on where you will be at in four, six, eight, 12 hours down the road. And you try to align that level of thinking while looking at a map to the impact zone, applying the resources that are coming into how they will overlay that impact zone and then how well does your prediction line up with the spread rate of the fire. There's some estimates that go on, there's some educated guesses, there's some experience that goes into all of those factors to figure out whether or not you're going to apply the right strategy to the incident. And there's good players that were there. there um, I will tell you the strength in our agency comes from not only the direction from our fire chief but it comes from the people that are in leadership roles in these given situations that have done it before and they've been they've been faced with this before and they're very level-headed clear thinkers it's it's interesting the definition of panic you know there is um, what might be a panic to one person could be a sense of urgency to another you can have a sense of urgency and you can usually show that by tone of voice all right we're going to save that house we got to hurry up and save this house you can usually do that by expression. You can usually do that by some slang or some key words that get people to move quicker, to let them know that, hey, we need to make this happen, you know, hastily, especially on the first responders part. You're the paid professionals to come in and deal with the situation. We don't have much time before people's lives are going to be in danger. So that sense of urgency is important. You don't want to panic. You don't want to overreact. But at the same time, you want to be deliberate with your actions. So as the fire progressed, the initial phases, it impacted so much so quick that we were really being hit on, I'll call it four fronts, uh, maybe three fronts you know, that we were being hit on. The primary uh, impact area initially was the north end of the city of Santa Paula. Here with Italian 30. We're looking at the glow. It looks like it's actually probably passing us up in the hills above. It's uh, probably in alignment with Harmon Canyon right now, from what we can tell. I think most people don't understand the way resources are ordered. You know, you have fire stations strategically placed throughout the county to respond in a timely manner for given emergencies. And those emergencies are, are, are vast. I mean, everything from automobile accidents to residential house fires to medical emergencies to whatever it is. You pick up the phone and you dial 911 because you have a problem. That problem is going to send a team out there. That team is made up of an engine company with a supervisor and driver and a firefighter, and they all have a skill set. And their skill set is to solve your problem. If we can't solve it, we're going to stop it from hurting any more people. 
We're going to try to bring resolve to the issue. We're going to try to protect the environment. We're going to try to also do whatever we can to treat the people that are affected by it. There's a systematic approach to dealing with emergencies. Well, in this given situation, there was so much impact that you didn't have enough resources to deal with it right away. Break, branch one, from operations. We're going to need to get some resources in. I believe I see some of your resources up Cemetery Road. Is that the uh, closest that you are engaging the fire for structure protection right now on Cemetery Road? Granted, we had even more on duty, and we had more people ready and posed to strike to assist in these kind of situations, but it's still not enough. And as you make the call for help, you have, if you were to think about this for a second, if I need 10 more fire engines, and where are you going to get them from? Well, you have to get them from a neighboring agency. But that neighboring agency, unbeknownst to you, is also suffering from the same weather phenomenon you are. And if you had that, you'd say, hey, our neighbors to the north of us have a fire. They need us right now. We'll, we'll give them half of what we have. Let's just say half. But they still have to protect their people. And they go, we can't give you everything, but we'll give you what we can. I will tell you that our partnerships that night came through for us. And we had the ability to get a lot of resources, in my mind, rather quickly. One of the, the key mistakes you made is don't get down in the weeds. Sometimes the leadership side of it is make sure you stay back far enough that you have the bigger picture. But when lives are threatened and things are happening, there's an expectation that you do both. And I found myself that night multiple times on both ends putting people in my car. I find myself continuously involved in the firefight, like assisting people that night. And I, that's where my first picture of the magnitude of this incident was going. You, no matter where you went, there were impacts. The wash, the actual ember wash that was out in front of the fire was uh, was intense. There was, as the fire was moving along the hillside, before we actually had two fires that had started that night. We had the original fire that was located just south of Thomas Aquinas College in the 150 corridor. And about maybe 45 minutes into that incident, um, roughly, uh, a second fire started that was up above um, on the Highway 150 corridor that started up around Koningstein Road in the Upper Ojai area. That fire rapidly came down the hill too, aligned with topography, wind, and in and around some homes, and it was immediately threatening structures, and we were trying to get resources into both fires. So we were being hit on the two fronts, and eventually the fires grew together. But at one time, the fire had crossed Highway 150, the fire up above had crossed Highway 150, and they were two separate fires, both of them heading rapidly to the west towards the city of Ventura towards Sulphur Mountain Road and towards Highway 33 if on a little bit bigger picture. It was a recipe for disaster. It had everything going for it. When the two fires joined, the amount of the fire was intense. And the, just the fire front is what we call it, the head of the fire that was moving across the foothills was producing embers. And that coupled with the wind, it was throwing firebrands and embers well over a mile in front of the fire. And we were having multiple new starts out in front. Those new starts are relatively small, but it doesn't. It only takes moments before they're, you know, they're, they're new fires of their own. And by the time that fire joins with those, next thing you know, you have a conflagration. Everything is a receptive fuel bed when the humidity is low. Everything will burn. Your lawn furniture will burn. Your houses. People leave a window open. Embers will find a way through your screens, into your, into your carpet, into your home, into your furniture, and you can have a house fire. And if you just thought, thought of the magnitude of the number of embers, you just don't have the water, the personnel, or the capability to suppress all of it. And that's what is a difficult picture to paint for people when you see the number, the, the ember cast that comes out of these things. And each one of those has the potential to start a new fire. For years, as I've trained and been a member of this department, I've, a lot of wisdom has passed on to myself from other members over the years. And there's, there's, I remember one thing that was in part on me years ago going, Somebody told me one time, going, hey, you will go to a fire one day where you may rely on your safety gear to save your life. Hopefully you don't put yourself in those positions all the time where you have to fall back going that my jacket will save my life. But the night of the Thomas fire, I've told this story multiple times that I felt that seeing where the companies were engaged in active firefighting, seeing the number of rescues that were taking place, seeing the exact magnitude and the positions they were putting themselves in, they were relying on their safety gear to save their life that night. 
that is where my awareness from being out there, where it's enough to raise the hair on the back of your neck where you go, there's a high probability that we, we could have firefighters injured or killed tonight. And that's not even talking the magnitude of the civilian impact. Most of the positions we put them in that night were for civilian rescue, where it was for to make sure we got people out. And again, we call it primary search. We had a lot of areas to make sure that, hey, our people out of the impact zone, our people out of the area. And evacuations do a good job. We can get people out of the area, but there are people that can't take care of themselves. There's, uh, there's elderly, there's invalids, there's, there's people that didn't get the early warning. There's people that were, may have been asleep, you know. There's hospitals where people are laying in beds and they're helpless. There, there's a lot of areas, if you think about it, where people need assistance. So you're constantly pumping uh, engine companies and firefighters into these areas. Looking at our current map of the fire where we're at, our fire is now at about eight to 10,000 acres and still being pushed by 50 to 60 mile an hour strong northeast winds. Um, potential impacts to the city of Ventura within two hours. Along with our partner agencies, along with law enforcement and search and rescue and uh, volunteer organizations are going into these environments to move people. And the sheer number of people we moved that night in success was unbelievable. I learned an awful lot that night. I learned, about, I learned a lot about my own capabilities and where I became overwhelmed and where there were some moments where I had to stop and go, okay, what am I not doing here? What am I not seeing? You know, there's some, I think anybody that when you get in these stressful situations and you're looking at things, I, I, this is nothing new to a lot of people dealing with a high impact stressful environment. But I tell people oftentimes, people haven't had to make decisions that we made that night. You know, there's a lot of inputs and I, I think one of the easy, we were talking about it, we're going, everybody needs to make sure their computers are clear. And what we mean is that every individual, we look at each one of us has a computer. That's our brain. It seemed like the night of that fire that everyone was processing information at a very rapid rate to a level of high success. It was an event where you were you were happy to see the level of engagement from everyone. And again, not just the fire department, all of our partner agencies. The, the level of engagement was high. I saw heroics that night from firefighters. I saw things where I don't and I don't even know the names of the people that were there. You know, other other departments, people coming to assist, literally uh, firefighters vomiting um, uh, on the streets. You're going, oh, well, that's no big deal. Well, it is a big deal when there's no air to breathe and there is no way to get out of it. You can only take so much. I mean, people think too that you can just do whatever with the suits that you wear, or the breathing apparatus you have on your back. Well, that's only a timed event. You know, you only have so much air on your back, and when you're in a sustained firefight for 12. 15, 24, 36 hours, it's, you, there is, there's no reprieve, there's nowhere. So I, can, I saw effort that was endless. And it gives you a real sense of pride in your agency and the fire service in general. It gives you an, an unbelievable amount of, um, of pride in, in the profession and what people were doing that night. I was driving on Foothill Road and the fire had crossed Foothill and I was down on Foothill when it actually jumped Foothill Road into the city of Ventura and we were starting to lose some homes um, below Foothill. And there was no equipment down there. Most of the equipment was still pumped up into some of the uh, other housing tracks. And I was trying to get some resources to come down there and expand the branch out a little bit better. And I was the only one who was really down there because most people were engaged in firefighting and I was looking out to where the next stand was going to be made more or less. And I had this vision in my line going, we need to stop trying to deal with the fire in and around here. We need to put a line in the sand and say the fire's not gonna go past us here, but you need enough resources to do that. You need to catch the fire. You gotta stop it. And in order to do something like that under those weather conditions, you need resources. You need lots of fire engines to do that. So I'm looking at areas where, we're, where I feel we are going to be successful. And during this time frame. I drive up and there's this, there's a residential structure on fire. The roof is on fire. There's people out there in their home. They have their garden hoses out. And right next door on the corner of uh, one of the streets off of Foothill, there's a bunch of junipers burning in the front yard. The fence is on fire, stuff's happening. There's a gentleman in his front yard with his family, with uh, his wife. They're loading the car up, gonna evacuate. I pull in the middle of the street, put my car in park, and I hop out of my car real quick. And he sees me and I go, hey, you've got fire all down the side of your house here. Um, is everyone out of your home? 
And I go, it's just a matter of moments before it's, it's into your house. And he goes, we're just getting the last bit of your stuff. And I go, let, let me help you. Let me help you get the rest of your stuff into your car. And I go, you got to get out of here and go left when you get here. He goes, it's zero visibility to the right. You're going to be driving through fire. They're getting ready to get in their car. And I'm on the side of his house. And he's got bushes right up against his garage. And I'm looking for a hose bib. And I don't have my helmet on. I have my shirt on. I've been driving around the car. I had my radio in my hand. I'm being called by a lot of people. I see the hose bib, and it's missing the top turn on thing and I'm looking around the ground and there's a pair of pliers so they must have had this problem for a while and I pick up the pliers and I start twisting the knob there and I get some water to come out of the spigot so I turn it back off again and now I need to find a hose and I'm going around his house and he meets me on the driveway and hands me a garden hose and it's one of those ones you see in the store that is coiled up about this big and so I, I hook this thing up and it's really a rusted old valve and I'm having trouble threading it on there right and I'm pretty calm and everything and the fire's getting closer and it, it's starting to take the house. And I'm able to get, get it screwed on and I get, a, uh, I get water in the hose and I'm starting to knock the fire down on the outside and I'm talking on the radio at the same time and I feel someone pat me on the shoulder. And I turn around and it's a retired fireman that used to work for our department and he's dressed I, in it, it what appeared to be like flannel pajamas. It was a flannel shirt or whatever. And I, he had just come from his home who lived close by and he saw me there and he goes, I'll, I'll take this from here. I give him the hose. And as I'm going back, there's cars that are on fire in the street. There's another neighbor's house that's starting to burn. Go over there real quick. I talk to them, try to get a hose hooked up, hop in my car, move it because my car is going to be burning. I got to, to the next street over to see where this fire is going to be going to see if we can start getting equipment into there. And as I came back to that house six, eight hours later, they're, they're still standing. The homes are still there. And I can only tell you that the reason those homes were still there was because of the gentleman who's retired that came up and took over. And it wasn't just him, it was neighbors helping neighbors. It was people that were there to go, hey, I'll bring you my garden hoses. Let's do what we can. Let's, let's rally together. It was very interesting to see the amount of support that neighbors were helping neighbors. And there was a lot of success that night. You see the devastation that when you go through the neighborhoods, and you think, well, well, nothing was saved. Not true. There was a ton of homes saved, but once again, Call it luck, call it opportunity, call it the way the, the, the way the house lined up with the ember wash, call it the way the, you know, how strong the wind was in that. What are the topographic features? Did they have a row of trees that sheltered them a little bit from the wind? You know, I, I don't know. But there were a lot of successes that night from everyday people just pulling up, helping other people. And then as I started, when I went back and I saw that, I paid more attention to it. I'd be driving around the streets and I would see people out there that didn't evacuate, that stayed um, to protect their home or they were below the evacuation line. They got their families out and then people came back up to assist neighbors and stuff. And I think it's interesting to see the compassion and the human element that was involved that evening. Just the day before the Thomas and even the day of that the fire started, I had been reading the report that had happened in Northern California about some of their successes and failures. and. Again, you learn. People can point fingers at people, but there is lessons to be learned and takeaways. Other people will glean success from other people's failures. And what I learned was, by reading that report, was learn more about evacuations and what are, what's the important aspects of evacuating people. And it stuck with me. And so that night when we rolled into the Thomas fire, that information stuck with me and I kept thinking in my head, no matter what, if there are people in front, we have to pull the trigger and give them fair warning to get out of the way. And when you set those parameters in your head or you draw a line, stick with your line. Meaning, and here's an example of that. If we were to say to you that, hey, if fire is approaching and we get fire that hits such and such Area. We have an area on a map that we, as a, we have identified as a trigger point or a, it, it is a, it's a management action point, we call them as well. Meaning that if this happens and it gets to here, we have to make notification to move people because it takes time to do that. It just doesn't happen. So if you set those hard lines and your conditions change, sometimes we have the ability to go, well, now that it doesn't look as bad, I'm not going to do this. If you set those triggers, then use them. Probably the biggest public message is to be aware of your surroundings. And no matter where you're at, if you're 
and again, I can tie this to anything that you do on a daily basis. It seems like most people in society today are distracted with other things that we don't have good situational awareness to what's going on around us. And it could be that we are connected to electronics way too much. It could be that we have too many things done for us and we become complacent. I think as citizens or as people, and something that I've told my kids now even coming out of this is, hey, pay attention to your surroundings and where you're at at any given time. You know, you're at the beach, you're in the water. Pay attention to what's going on around you. Pay attention to where lifeguards at. Pay attention to where you live. Look at the bigger picture. And oftentimes we don't, we're so preoccupied with things. So even when it comes to evacuations, if I was gonna give any kind of warning to people with evacuations is this, if you live in an area that is prone to fire, have you ever discussed with your family what we will do in the event of evacuations? What things are important to you? How would you get out? How would you get into your car and where would you drive to? Do you have a way of connecting with your kids if, you're, if your kids are at school, if your loved ones are in location? Do you have a rally point? Do you have a way that you've discussed going, if anything were to happen, here's what I want you to do. Do you have things on hand to prepare for a disaster? This is just another scope of an emergency, you know, whether it be an earthquake, fire, flood, it, it's still just another disaster and you would deal with most of them the same way that you would deal with something else, you know. So I just think if you put a little thought into it, and a little preparatory action, you'd be amazed at the outcomes and the success rate of protecting your loved ones.